opportunity to receive Walking in God's Word, a special book from Dr. Frederick K.C. Price, featuring scriptural promises direct from the Word of God. In this attractive, convenient book, you'll have an important resource for discovering how to deal with adversity, sickness, financial problems, fear, addictions, and many other difficulties that you may be facing today. Call right now at 1-800-927-3436 or write to Dr. Frederick K.C. Price, P.O. Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, 90009, and we'll send your copy absolutely free. Walking in God's Word. If you read only one book this year, other than the Bible, this is the book for you. Featuring a special section outlining the principles of faith written by Dr. Price, this is the first book you'll reach for when you're looking for help, comfort, and counsel. Walking in God's Word. Where else could you find such a valuable reference? You can be an overcomer by believing God's Word and standing on His promises. Dr. Fred Price's Walking in God's Word. Finally, the scriptural promises that can change your life forever. Call for your free copy today. Ever-increasing faith. From Los Angeles, California. With pastor and teacher, Dr. Frederick K.C. Price. Welcome to Ever Increasing Faith. Remember these words from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Praise God for another day and for another privilege and opportunity to share with you the living Word of God. Let's turn in our Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, I'm reading from the Ever-Increasing Faith Study Bible, which is the New King James Version. You may be reading from the authorized or traditional King James, which is quite all right. But just so if you hear a few words that are different, you'll understand why. Now, I'm going to simply say this in reference to the television audience. I need your financial support. On the screen is an address where you can mail your tithe offering and gift of love. Thank you very much. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I want to begin reading in verse 12. When you have it, say, I have it. I have it. All right, follow along. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is what? Risen, Risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came what? Death. Death. By man also came the resurrection of the what? Death. Dead. For as in Adam all what? Die. Even so in Christ all shall be made what? Alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Afterward those that are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. 
The last enemy that will be destroyed is what? Death. Death. Now, <clears throat> I want to ask a question and then proceed scripturally to do some justice to answering the question. If Christ did not rise, what then? If Christ did not rise, what then? That's our subject. Now I want you to look particularly, verse 23 again, it says, but each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Well, actually go back to verse 22. It says, for as in Adam all what? Even so in Christ all shall be made what? But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. All will be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Suppose he came today. Would you be ready? And you don't have a guarantee that he's not going to come today. Amen. Now, we're asking the question, if Christ did not rise, what then? This is, this is Easter Sunday. And it's tradition all over the world. People today have been, depending on the time zone, have been, are, and will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ because that's what Christianity really is all about if, if Christ did not rise from the dead then Christianity is just another religion and of course in college if you go to college uh, you may take a course in comparative religions and Christianity is listed among the religions of the world unfortunately God never calls it a religion Unfortunately, it is not a religion. Unfortunately, it has been fabricated and formed into a religion. But Jesus never came to bring religion. Amen. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Religion brings a walking death. It does not bring life. Christianity is not a religion. Though it's referred to as the Christian religion, that is a misnomer. It's taken out of its setting. Christ is not about religion. Now, let's look at John chapter 11. We're going to look at quite a few scriptures here. And uh, for some it will be a review, but for some others I know it will be absolute revelation. John chapter 11, and uh, we'll look at verse 20. Four. John 11 and 24. When you have it, say, I got it. All right. Listen to this. Verse 24. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. This is Martha's brother, Lazarus, who had died. And Mary and Martha were in distress. They were hurt as someone would be hurt at the demise of a loved one. And so Jesus had come on the scene. And the sisters were glad that Christ was there and said, even too bad that you weren't here before because if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask God, he'll do it. <laughs> Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am. <laughs> I am. I am the resurrection. See, the resurrection is not a day. The resurrection is a man. We say resurrection day. 
and that's all right. You, you know, it's not a problem. But that is, it's not, it's not a day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He said to the sister. Now, unfortunately, translation of the Bible is a human production. And I believe that the men do the best they can, but because they're imperfect, they don't always translate perfectly. That's why it's good sometimes to compare different translations and you get the best of all of them. Um, this verse here in the, in the New King James, though the New King James is an excellent translation in 99% of all the other cases, I prefer it to the other because it's, it's in the language that we speak today, plus it's bumped up in most cases to where it ought to be. But here, I believe the translators made a grave error. Look at verse 25. It says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die. Now, I like the traditional King James because it says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead. This is, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe it? See, if you look at it, you can tell. See, he's, if you look at it in the New King James, he says, He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. That's a contradiction. Because he said, if you believe in me, you won't die. Then in the other verse it says, though he may die. And then in the next verse he says, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So I think that the King James does a better job because it says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead. Now he's talking there about spiritual death. See, every man, every boy, girl, every baby that comes out of its mother's womb is spiritually, as it were, spiritually dead. Meaning, cut off from God. Not dead so that they're not alive and don't exist, but simply dead to God. Like we say, the phone went dead. Well, we don't have a funeral and buried a telephone, do we? But what we mean is that there's no communication, not working. Can't hear anybody. Hello, hello, hello. Click, 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 click. So we say the phone is dead. Well, he didn't die. We're not going to bury it and have a resurrection or have a funeral, I should say. Okay? But we mean that figuratively. It, it, it's not performing like it should. So every person that's born into the world is born into the world spiritually dead, cut off from God. That's what Jesus is all about. That's the only reason why he had to come, because man was spiritually dead, cut off from God, and God wanted to reconcile man to himself, and the only way he could do that was through a mediator or a savior, Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. So what Jesus is saying here, he who believes in me, though he were spiritually dead, he shall spiritually live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die spiritually again. Okay? That's what he's talking about. But here's the, the one, that, that just a side issue. The main issue that I want you to get is Jesus said, I am. Say, I am. I am. Say, Jesus am. Jesus am. See, that's good English because Jesus said, I am. So if I am, Jesus am. <laughs> right? Jesus said, I am the resurrection. So Jesus am the resurrection. Okay, I am. He said, I am. So Christ is the resurrection. Not a day, but it's a man. Just like it doesn't matter what day Christ returns, because he returns, there will be a resurrection. Because he is the resurrection. It's not a day, it's a him. It's a he. It's Jesus. He is the resurrection. Now, go to Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> if Christ did not rise, what then? What then? Romans chapter 6. When you have it, say I have it. <laughs> Verse 9. It says, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies, how often? No more. no more. Why? Death no longer has what? Dominion, Dominion over him. Right. Now, understand that this word resurrection is not just a word. 
it has a very specific and wonderful meaning. Resurrection means that you can't die anymore. See, it's a difference between resurrection and being raised from the dead. When you're raised from the dead, you have to die again. When you're resurrected, you can't die anymore. We just read it, death has no more dominion over you, over Christ. And when we're resurrected, if we die before he returns, then we'll never die anymore. See, death is alien to man. Death is alien six. <laughs> it, 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 it's alien to man. We were never created to die. But because of sin, death was allowed to enter in. So Jesus is the antithesis of death. He's the resurrection. Now, for instance, when Jesus walked the earth, and we just read it in that 11th chapter of John, <clears throat> about when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, the man Lazarus had died. Well, see, Lazarus had to die again. So Lazarus died twice. Physically died twice. Because when you're raised from the dead, you're not resurrected from the dead. Therefore, death still has dominion over you, and you will have to die again. J. Iris' 12-year-old daughter, if you remember the story, they were, Jesus was called to the house, and a little 12-year-old girl had died before he arrived. He raised her from the dead. He didn't resurrect her. He raised her from the dead. So she had to die again. Fight it, brother. All right, the widow of Nain's son. They were on their way to the cemetery <laughs> to have the burial. The man was in a coffin or beer, as they called it in those days. And they were on their way to the cemetery. Jesus had compassion on the mother and stopped the procession and said to the young man, I say unto you, arise. And the young man arose. Now he had to die again. Because he wasn't resurrected, he was raised from the dead. You get the difference now? Being raised from the dead gives you life, but it's still only temporary because death still has dominion over you. But when you're resurrected, you can never, ever, oh my Lord, thank you Jesus. You can never, ever, no more, no how, no way, never, ever die anymore. What? Death has no more dominion over you. That's what Jesus is all about. All right. Now, let's look at Acts chapter 12. If Christ did not rise, what then? <clears throat> Acts chapter 12 and verse 4. Now, who has a traditional King James Version that's close to me? Let's swap out for just a second, okay? Just for a second. Don't you, don't you keep my Bible now. Don't, don't, don't start no stuff, girl. Now, I want to read this from the traditional. It says this, verse 4, 12 and 4, book of Acts. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, if you're reading from the traditional King James, thank you very much, that's the word that's in there, but it's an incorrect translation. The word Easter does not appear in the Bible. Amen. It's not a Christian word. Or, let me say it this way, it's not a biblical word. Okay? It's a religious word. Now, here's, what it, here's the way it should read, because the word translated Easter in the King James Version of the Bible is the actual Greek word Pasha. And the word Pasha means Passover. And this is the way it reads. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Amen. Now that's actually what it should be. Now, Easter. Where in the world do we get Easter? Well, Easter is definitely pagan. It is not Christian. It has been incorporated into Christianity by religion. But it's not Bible. Because see, Easter is not a synonym for resurrection. 
Do you get that? Amen. It's not a etymological synonym for resurrection. It's just simply been incorporated into Christianity. And the way that all happened because of Emperor Constantine, or Constantine, however you want to pronounce that, who embraced Christianity and then decreed that Christianity would be the state religion. And as a result of it becoming the state religion, it was very fashionable then to become a Christian. Everybody became a Christian automatically without ever receiving Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. It was just automatic because they were citizens of the empire and because the emperor had declared Christianity now is the state religion, then everybody became a Christian by law, not by the new birth. Now, because of trying to keep peace, you know, you have all kinds of people with all kinds of ideas, and when people came in, they had their idea of how things ought to be run, or they had their idea how this ought to be, or they had that idea. And so in order to appease everybody politically, as well as religiously, then the emperor allowed them to bring all kinds of things into it. That's where the bunny rabbits came from. There ain't no bunny rabbits in the Bible. Now, I'm using my very best English. Ain't no bunny rabbits in the Bible, and no bunny rabbits have nothing to do with Jesus. Amen. Pink rabbits, white rabbits, brown rabbits, and nothing about the colored eggs and the speckled eggs and all that stuff. None of that has anything to do with Jesus, but because of Christianity becoming the state religion, then all these things just sort of flowed into the church, into religion, and so then it became fashionable, and now down through the years we have all these things associated with it. There is bunny rabbits, chocolate eggs, ordinary eggs, no kind of eggs, any kind of eggs, white eggs, brown eggs, pickled eggs, it doesn't make any difference what kind of eggs, baskets, all that stuff, all that had to do with paganism. All had to do with paganism. And what happened is that in the pagan rites, especially the Vestal Virgins of Babylon, it, they had this thing that every year at the end of the winter and the beginning of springtime, when everything is like a resurrection, that's why they put it in there with Christ, because it's sort of like the ground, nature, everything is resurrected, the animals come out of hibernation, the trees begin to blossom, the grass begins to grow, the wildflowers begin to sprout out, and so then in the, in the bunny rabbits begin to produce, and nobody is a more prolific producer than the rabbit. The rabbit is a super califragilistic expialidocious producer and so the egg symbolizes and the rabbit symbolizes life. So that's why they put them together but there's a danger there. The danger is we get hung up and strung out on the rabbit and all the rest of that stuff and it has nothing to do with Jesus and the resurrection. So all of that is definitely pagan in origin. Now, don't misunderstand me. There is nothing intrinsically wrong with a basket or an egg, or if you want to color the eggs, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's no law against eggs, no law against baskets, none of that. It's not like it's wrong. It's just not true as it relates to Jesus Christ. Okay? So if you want to have some eggs, ain't not a thing in the world wrong with eggs. Nothing wrong with eggs. Nothing wrong with coloring them if you want to. Speculums, polka dot them any way you want it. It's not a problem. Just don't associate them with Jesus because they don't have anything to do with each other. Okay, and that's the only danger. So that people get hung up on the rabbits and the Easter and all that kind of stuff and don't think nothing about Jesus. They don't come to know him. You can have all the baskets you want, you're still going to hell. <laughs> so you better know Jesus, the Jesus of Easter, rather than the rabbits and the bunnies and the eggs. Okay? Now I have a question for you. Because I, I believe, I, 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 but, oh gosh, how many years ago? I, I started looking, at, looking this up many years ago because it bothered me. I believe that if this Bible is true, you know, I believe it is. But I wasn't there when they wrote it, neither were you. So we don't know. We, we, we take it by faith. And, and, and I don't know if there, you know, I don't know by sight if there is a God in the sense of having personally met him seen his driver's license, validated him on the computer that he was in existence. You know what I'm saying? So, but we buy faith and we have evidence that there is a creator, but the Bible says that he's God and that he's Heavenly Father. Well, I believe that. I don't have any doubt about my believing it, 
But I believe that if that part is right, then every part has to be right. If I can find any fault, legitimate fault with any of it, then I have to throw it all out. Okay? So I, I had questions about it. And the one big, biggest question that bothered me just drove me up the wall. I mean, just was, for me. Now, for you, it might not be a problem. But the problem I had was this Good Friday thing. What's so good about Friday? <laughs> Unless it's payday. <laughs> and then that means we have a resurrection every week. Hallelujah. I like that, huh? But seriously, I wondered about Good Friday. And then when I would read the Bible, and uh, in fact, we're, we're going to read it in just a moment. In fact, well, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's, 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 um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. I tell you what let's do. Let's look at Matthew chapter 12. Okay, Matthew chapter 12. Then I'll tell you about what, what my, my problem was. And I think that this is a problem for a lot of people. I remember uh, talking to a young man. I, I was trying to uh, witness to him about Jesus and about his need of Christ. And, and he was telling me that Christianity was a legend. And, um, you know, that this was wrong and that was wrong and the other thing was wrong because of this. And so I said, well, you know, that, that, that's a valid point. If this thing is real, then, it, then it's got to be consistent all the way down the line. And uh, I'll show you what I mean just a moment. We're almost there. All right. Uh, Matthew. Did I say Matthew? Matthew chapter 12. And uh, yeah, yeah, verse, uh, yeah, I'm almost there. Okay. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. It says, for as Jonah, this is Jesus speaking, for as Jonah was three days, say three days, three days. and three nights, three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now that's, that's, that's Jesus speaking. Now here was my dilemma. If Sunday is resurrection day, and the man was crucified on Friday. I could not, to save my life, compute three days and three nights from Saturday, I mean from Friday evening till Sunday morning. I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't get three nights and three days out of that. Just wasn't no way in the world I could squeeze it. I tried every mathematical formula that I heard about and then I invented a few on my own to try to figure it out. It is just no way you can get three days and three nights from Friday evening to Sunday morning. So then I could disqualify Christianity. It's not true because this resurrection thing doesn't compute, doesn't work. Can't get three days and three nights. Jesus said, I'll be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And you can't get three days and three nights. I don't care how you count. From Friday evening, just before six o'clock, which would be the beginning of the Sabbath day for the Saturday Sabbath, weekly Sabbath. There's no way you can get three days and three nights from Friday night to Sunday morning. It's impossible. So then if that's untrue, then maybe everything else is untrue. I was concerned. Because as far as I know, I only have one life to live. And let me live it as a blonde. I mean, I only have one life to live. <laughs> and so if I only have one life to live, I, I got to know. I don't have time. This is, this is no time for roulette. And this is no time for lotto or none of that other stuff. I can't gamble on this. I only have one life to live. I got to know that I know that I know as far as I can know that my no knows that I'm on the right boat. I can't afford to get to the end because I can't go back and start over. Ain't like running track. You might, you get a couple of false starts and you can go back and start over. <laughs> you don't get no life, no false starts in life. You either is or you ain't. You're here or you're not, right? So I couldn't figure that out. So that was a, a real concern to me. Now, I have a question. Did Jesus die on Friday? 
Well, see, see, you, some folks say, some say, some say, yeah, some say, no, some said, I don't know. Well, see, that's the whole thing. If in, if this thing is real, we ought to be able to prove it biblically that 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 is so. Otherwise, we need to chunk it, chuck it, <laughs> whatever, chunk it, boom, <laughs> you know, dump it. Okay. All right. Let's look at Mark chapter fifteen, and let's find out. Mark's Gospel chapter fifteen. Let's find out. I wanted to know. Inquiring minds wanted to know. And I had and do have a very inquiring mind. I want to know. And if anybody can know, I'll be the one to know. You know, because I intend to know. If it's knowable, why not me? Is there a reason why I can't know? Is there a reason why you can't know? Well, that's all I'm talking about, see? So I, I just, that's why I said, I want to know. And I found out, and I want to share that with you. All right, now watch this. Mark 15, ay, 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 uh, verse 42. It says, now when evening, say evening. evening. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. Now I want you to underline the word preparation day and the word Sabbath. These are very critical words for our present discussion. Now flip over to John chapter 19. John's Gospel, chapter 19. Now, I would say this for some of you. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be, this is a very dangerous day for you to be in church. But see, it's too late now. You're in here now and you've heard enough. You're going to be held accountable for this. So you can sit there and sleep if you want to and think you don't need to listen. But boy, one of these days it's going to come up before you in the judgment day. Well, I don't believe in no judgment day. Are you sure? Okay. Have it your way. But don't say, I didn't warn you. All right, chapter 19. Uh, first verse would be verse 14. It says, now it was the preparation day of the Passover. Now underline the word preparation day and Passover. Two very important words. All right. Let's look now at, in that same chapter, verses, we'll begin at verse 31 of that 19th chapter of John, verse 31. It says, therefore, because it was the preparation day, underline that again, the word preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath. Underline the word Sabbath. For that Sabbath, underline the word Sabbath, was a high day. Underline the words high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Okay, did you get the words? Preparation day, underline it. For, uh, and then the next word is on the Sabbath, Sabbath. Then the next words would be Sabbath again, and then high day. I want you to get that, it's very important. Now, <clears throat> notice that in each one of those cases, it said preparation day. That means preparing for the day. Preparation day. Preparation of the Sabbath. Then it says that that was a high day. So just the very fact that it says a high day lets you know it couldn't have been the ordinary weekly Sabbath. That's right. Because if that were the case, then every weekly Sabbath would be a high day. That's right. And there would be no distinction between any of the other days. So what would be a low day? You wouldn't have one. A day is a day is a day. So a high day, just like a holiday. Uh, when we use the word holiday, that's a special day. That's not the every single day. That's an unusual day. A holiday is a special day, right? Well, when it says high day, that was a special day. But notice it was called a Sabbath. Now, I believe that the problem traditionally has risen because the religious people in the past didn't take the time to distinguish between the weekly, every seventh day, Saturday Sabbath, and other days that were also called Sabbaths. Now, turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. That's in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 12. That's on page 57. 
Okay, Exodus chapter 12. Very important. If Christ did not rise, what then? Well, if we can't figure out three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday, then maybe he didn't rise. Maybe this whole thing is a legend. Maybe it's nothing to it at all but religion. Well, if so, I need to find that out. I got better things to do on Sunday than come to church and waste my time in church. If this thing is not real, I could, I could be sleeping in. Amen. I don't know about you, but I don't need no pacifier. <laughs> huh? Me, I don't need to be pacified. If this is not real, then I'm out of here fast. All right, Exodus chapter 12. You got it? All right. Look at verse 6. It says, now you shall keep it. Un well, I wanted to start reading at verse 1. I'm sorry. Let's read it verse 1. You follow along. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month, say this month, shall be your beginning of months. So if that's true, then that means that that was the first month for the Hebrews or for Israel. In other words, it'd be like our January. That's the first month of of our solar years we call it what January right so watch this now he said now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying this month shall be your beginning of month it shall be the first month of the year to you so this is this is their first month all right watch this verse 3 speak to all the congregation of Israel saying on the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father a lamb for a household and if the household is too small for the lamb let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons according to each man's need you shall make your count for the lamb your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year you may take it from the sheep or from the goats now you shall keep it until the 14th day underline the word 14th day most important words you'll ever see now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight that means just before the sun goes down you kill it just when it starts to shade off at the end of the day. Now, let's find out what month this was. Turn to the book of Esther, chapter 3. I want you to see this. That's on page 437. If you're reading from the Ever-Increasing Faith Study Bible, 437. Esther. Now, if you don't know where that is, find the book of Job. And the book just before Job is the book of Esther. No, I'm, trying to, I'm not trying to be silly. I want to help you because I want to move on. But I want you to see this. I don't want you to just hear it. It's not, it's not so because I say so. I want you to see it with your own little beady eyes. Amen. Okay? So then you don't have any excuse. You can say, I disagree with Brother Price. But you won't be able to say, I disagree with Brother Christ. Because you, you have to say, well, it was there. It was right there in front of me. All right. You got it? If you got it, say, I got it. All right. Esther, chapter 3, verse 7. Now, remember what we just read. God said to Aaron and Moses that this will be the first month for you, right? And then he said on the 14th day of the month, you'll kill this lamb, right? Now we want to find out what month that was. Verse 7 of Esther says in the first month, that's that first month again, which is the month of Nisan. That's all I wanted you to get. You can read the rest on your own. But the, I wanted you to get the name of the month. It was the month of Nisan, and that's the first month of the year. You keep that in mind because we're going to come back to that principle in just a moment. Now, for your information, in the year that Jesus supposedly was crucified, in the year 30 A.D., supposedly died in the month of April, he died because, see, remember John the Baptist when John the Baptist was looking and he had his disciples around him one day and he was looking and he saw Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold the Lamb, behold the Lamb, Be anybody ever read that? <laughs> behold the Lamb of God, which does what? Takes away the sin of the world. Who does? What does the Lamb of God? He said, the Bible says he saw Jesus walking and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus was the 
true Pasha or Passover lamb. He was what the types and the shadows were all about back there in Exodus when God told every household to take a lamb. That was a type. That was a shadow of the real lamb. When John said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world, all of the Passovers were pointing to Jesus. Now I wouldn't argue with anybody and I'm not going to go into battle about it, but there are really, there, the Passover, really, there is no Passover now. Now, really, I understand the only people, the Orthodox people who still maintain that Jesus was not Messiah, they're still exercising the Passover ordinance, but there really is no Passover because Jesus was the fulfillment of the Passover. Because the Passover lamb was a type and a shadow until the real came along. Now, in 30 AD when Jesus was crucified, in the month of April, remember we just read it, it said that it was the preparation of the Passover. Remember that? We just read it. It was, it said we, can, we can't leave the bodies on the cross because it's the preparation of the Passover and that day was a high day. And it's called a Sabbath day. Not the weekly Sabbath, but a Sabbath nonetheless. And in the year that Jesus died, he had to die on the same day to fulfill what the types and shadows had been indicating all those years. He had to die in the month of Nisan and he had to die and be killed on the 14th day of Nisan to fulfill the types and the shadows. And in that year, when Jesus died, it was the 14th day of Nisan. Now watch this. Let's find out about these Sabbaths because that's, that's, the, that's the kicker, as it were. That's the thing that people have stumbled over is the word Sabbath because they have in their mind Sabbath. Yes, Saturday is the Sabbath. That's right. Saturday is the Sabbath. It never will be any other day but Saturday. That's the Sabbath. Day of rest. The seventh day, God ended his creation. He rested on the Sabbath day. The seventh day, hallowed that day, set it apart for man so that that stupid idiot would take one day and rest. And even with that, he's still working nine days a week. But the whole idea was that he could rest. We were told to rest the land. We, have, we haven't done that. That's why I got this bad food. Because we haven't done what God told us to do about the land. We pumped the land and pumped the land and pumped the land. when we should let it go a whole year and don't plant anything. And God, by his creative power, has already put into the ground all the necessary workers, the little creatures that would turn the soil. And that soil in the end of that year would be perfect and ready to go for another seven years, another six years. But we don't do it so anyway. All right, let's look at this now. No, that's just a little side issue, no charge on that. Numbers chapter 28. Numbers chapter 28. Now here's what I want you to do. Y'all, you all mark this down. And mark these scriptures down and then look them up. Because I don't have time to wait. Y'all you, going to slow me down. Numbers 28 verse 16. What did I say? Number 28 verse 16. If you got it, say I got it. All right, I don't got it yet. Yay! <laughs> All right, page 147, you got it? All right, look at this, verse 16, beginning with verse 16. It says, on the 14th, uh-oh, there's that 14th day. On the 14th day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. Passover. And on the 15th day of this month is the feast. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. Now that word convocation means Sabbath. And we'll see that, it, see that in just a moment. Now, in verse, or in Le Leviticus rather, chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus comes just before Numbers. So that's just back up a little bit and you'll be right there. Leviticus the 23rd chapter. Okay, got it? See, I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay, Leviticus chapter uh, chapter 23, verse 3. Leviticus 23 and 3. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. So can you see then that this is synonymous? 
that convocation, holy convocation, is the same as Sabbath. Sabbath is the same as a holy convocation. You understand that? Six days shall work be done. This is a weekly Sabbath now, and notice that God calls it a holy convocation. Okay? Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Verse 4, these are the feasts of the Lord. Notice the word feast is pluralized, meaning more than one. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, plural, which you shall proclaim at their appointed time on the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, but you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. Alright. Look at that same chapter uh, at the 24th verse. It says, speak to the children of Israel saying in the seventh month. Ah, what month is this now? Seven. Seventh month. In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a what? A what? Sabbath rest. Notice again now, speak to the children of Israel, verse 24, saying in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Verse 26, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, verse 27, Also the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a what? Holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. All right, you got it. You got the holy convocations. Now, while you're right there in that same chapter, look at verse 32. Verse 32 says, it shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn what? Rest. And you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. Say evening. From evening to evening you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Now notice the, notice the word evening. Evening to evening is a Sabbath. Evening to evening is a Sabbath. In other words, evening, until that evening comes back again, that's the Sabbath. All right, look at verse 34. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this month, of this seventh month, shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a what? Holy convocation. You shall do no what? Customary work on it. It's the Sabbath. So can you see that there are more than one kind of Sabbath? that it wasn't just a weekly Sabbath. And here's something else that's very interesting and I think important to us to understand. If you go through and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are the books that give us the ministry or the earthly life of the Lord Jesus Christ, you never one single time, not one single time, not one time, not even one time, not one time do you ever see the word preparation used in reference to the weekly Saturday, Sabbath. Never, ever, no how, no way, no time. Never. So the preparation was a preparation for something special. It was the Passover. Now, how long did Jesus say he would be in the grave? Well, we've already read it in Matthew 12, 40. He said, three days as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish or in the belly of the whale, three days and three nights. So shall the Son of Man be in the heart of earth, in the heart of the earth. Go to Matthew chapter 27 this time. Matthew 27. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Ah, Matthew 27. You got it? All right, look at the 63rd verse. Saying, sir... In fact, let's look at verse 62. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation... Uh, day of preparation. The chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After what? Three days. Three days I will rise. Look at Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. 
Got it? All right. Verse 31 says, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after what? Rise again. When? I said when? Now, I submit to you that the preparation of the Sabbath a high day was the fulfillment of the prophecies in reference to or the types and shadows of the Passover. And that on the 14th day of Nisan in that year, 30 AD in April, Jesus was crucified. I submit to you that that day in that year came on a Wednesday, not a Friday came on a Wednesday. Now remember, we found out that the Sabbath is from what to what? Evening to evening. Now if you could put a time, a chronological time on it, it's approximately six o'clock in the evening. In the six o'clock in the evening, because that's, if I'm not mistaken, for the Jews today who observe, uh, observe Sabbath, it's six o'clock Friday evening. So six o'clock Friday, a uh, Saturday evening is considered the Sabbath day. Now, if you go back in the scripture, and I don't have time to do it, but you'll find out that actually Jesus died around three o'clock in the afternoon. Because it said it was the ninth hour and he breathed his last. Yeah. Starting at six o'clock in the morning to twelve o'clock noon is six hours. From twelve o'clock to three o'clock is nine hours. The ninth hour, therefore, is three o'clock in the afternoon. He was dead before the Sabbath began. And it took a little while for them to for him to hang there and, and, and having died and then for uh, Joseph to go to Pilate and beg the body and then they took the body down and wrapped it up and all that kind of stuff. He had to be off that cross before the Sabbath began. The Holy Convocation, the special day, the Passover Sabbath. So I submit that Jesus died on Wednesday. They put him in the grave on Wednesday night, which was actually the beginning of the Sabbath day or the Holy Convocation day or the Passover day. Okay? So, Wednesday night became the first night in the grave, looking at it from our standpoint. Thursday, the first day. Thursday night, the second night, and Friday, the second day. Friday night, the third night, and Saturday, the third day. And, and so then at six o'clock on Saturday evening, that's actually when the first day of the week began, what we call Sunday. See, we think of day is when the daylight comes. But actually, in terms of chronology, it's at six o'clock in the evening, the day actually begins. Okay? So, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, three nights. Thursday day, Friday day, Saturday day, three days. And when the women came early Sunday morning, the first day of the week, he was not there. He had already risen, just like he said. Now, let's watch this now. Um, Matthew 28. That's how you get your three days and your three nights. And it all fits in chronologically with the prophecy and the fulfillment of the types and the shadows. Not the prophecy, but the, the types and the shadows. It has to. Oh, my, 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 my. Oh, you gotta go fast here. 28, Matthew 28. You getting anything out of this? Yeah. All right. This proves it, so you don't have any... Okay, all right, I, I, mean, I won't say that. Okay, Matthew 28 and 1. Matthew 28 and 1. Now, after the Sabbath... Uh-oh, wait a minute. What? After the Sabbath. What? what? Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn. First day of the week is Sunday. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. 
And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and, and he sat on it, and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, etc. Verse 4, and the guard shook for fear, so forth and so on. Verse 6, uh, verse 5, but the angel answered and said unto the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you see Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. And they came as it began to dawn. Now, watch this. See, he didn't rise on the first day of the week. He didn't rise on Sunday. He rose Saturday. Somewhere between 6 o'clock, he rose before it got light because it said as it began to dawn. Now, watch this. Watch this. Turn to Mark chapter 16. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Christ did not rise with him. I declare that he rose just as he said. And right in line with the Bible, with the scriptures, not with tradition. And you can check all this out because this is, this, is, this is historical information. Did you know how to put it together? It's not just hearsay. Those days are true. All right, Mark chapter 16, verse 9. It says, now when he rose early on the first day of the week. Now look at that. Doesn't that look just like I, it completely puts me out, doesn't it? It's a contradiction of what I just said and what it said. But here's what I want you to realize. You know this, that when they wrote the Bible, it was not written in chapters and verses, and there were no punctuation marks. Punctuation marks are added by the translators, and they sometimes mess up the situation. I want to just show you how important this is. Watch this now, verse 9. Now when he, now when he rose early on the first day of the week, that's now the way it should be punctuated. Here's the way it should be punctuated. Now when he arose, comma... Early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Oh, yeah, you got that, huh? See the difference? Oh, oh the comma makes it. See, it didn't say that he rose the first day. By putting that comma in there, it does exactly what it says it's supposed to do. Now, when he arose, comma, early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. That's what it's saying. It did not say he rose on that day. He rose, and I'm out of time. Jesus lives. We walk by faith, not by sight. This dynamic faith message that you've just heard on today's ever-increasing faith program is now available on audio cassette to use in your personal Bible study or to share with your family and friends. The entire faith lesson presented on today's program is included on the tape and will be sent to you for your love gift in support of this ministry. Just write and request program number ES97. Send your love gift to Dr. Frederick K.C. Price, Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, 90. 0009. And mention the call letters of this station. Ask for program number ES97. Allow four to five weeks for delivery and join Dr. Price again for another hour of ever-increasing faith.